It says SAP 105, Unit 7, Social and Political Framework. In the United States, in the world, uh, the whole idea of garbage, the whole idea of products, uh, was ignored for a long time. Uh, pollution from stormwater, pollution from uh, toilets, pollution from factories uh, was ignored throughout the world. And in real life, uh, the Greeks and the Romans, uh, back in the time before Christ, had a better control of the environment than we do. There was a better running water and better um, sewer disposal in Rome than there was in the late 1800s in London. We finally began to equate the two together that not taking care of the environment uh, led to poor diseases control for humans uh, as well as other huge problems. In the United States, the first act was the Rivers and Harbors Act in 1899. This is one of the oldest federal environmental laws. It finally became a crime for all these factories to put their products into any type of stream. They needed a permit to do right now. It did not control the problem, but it started to limit the problem. Now you have to remember that it was very easy for people to drop things into the rivers and streams. It was carried away so people didn't notice the problems. Uh, President Theodore Roosevelt and his aide, uh, Gifford Pinchot, were the first people to really come together to make national laws to control this. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt was huge in the environmental program. Uh, there are many pictures of him uh, out touring the country. The whole idea of the National Park, the National Forestry Service, were developed about then. Uh, Yellowstone became one of the first parks out there. Uh, there were books published at that time talking about the depl deplorable conditions in factories, talking about the, um, the discharge from factories. Uh, the Jungle by Upton Sinclair was first published, and we started to get an idea of what the working conditions were like. Uh, he wrote about the cattle meatpacking industry. The public gradually became aware as we became, uh, as we moved into the, the 20th century, with better communication, uh, the railroad expanded all across the United States, the telegraph was out there, the radio started coming out there, we began to see these problems. We began to look at the factories, we began to look at the poor conditions. Uh, the miners were one of the first examples of the average lifespan of a miner was much decreased compared to the national uh, average. The people then started suing. And these courts gave the environment new power. The, all these movements had a big idea that they needed to show that there's interconnection with all animals and plants. They needed to show that when these factories polluted, they decreased the human health. We also realized that we may run out of uh, chemicals, we may run out of oil, we may run out of fertilizers. We may run out of plants if we don't do something about that. Richard Carson was one of the uh, first people out there who gained national prominence. She had developed uh, um, many ways to show that pesticides were harming the environment. She wanted to advocate this responsible and carefully managed use she did not say that we needed to get rid of chemicals. Uh, she came before the Congress and showed the damage that there were to birds. She wrote this silent spring in 1962, and it quickly became a bestseller across the United States. Uh, it showed that the uncontrolled pesticide use was especially bad to birds. It changed the whole idea of their eggs. Their eggs were not strong enough contain their babies. The Silent Spring was to show what would happen if we had a spring without birds. Uh, she became before 
Congress, and this was shown across the whole United States in the newspapers and, and the radio at this time. This led to a new act, the Clean Air and Clean Water Act, showing that the environmental movement was spreading. Another big act was the Scenic Hudson Preservation Conference versus the Federal Power Commission. At that time, the federal government wanted to have a power plant on Stonekey Mountain. This was miles away from any city. Fortunately, the Scenic Hudson Preservation Conference all got together and forced the Federal Power Commission to negate the plans out there. Again, because of this being spread across the United States with the newspaper, radio, television, that we again increased our knowledge of environmental problems. We now had a National Environmental Policy Act. There was a Natural Resource Defense Council. Many more groups had banded together to form national groups. All of these issues on the left-hand side of this slide uh, shows you what the environmental groups, what Congress did to combat problems. Uh, for example, in water, they developed the Federal Water Pollution Control Act. They had the Clean Water Act. They had the Safe Water Drinking Act. All of these got together to show that humans needed safe water for this. We had oil spills. Well, we now had an oil pollution act, toxic substances. All of this was created by the federal government to protect us. The EPA was created. Uh, there are 10 different regions across the United States that show that there are different environmental concerns in each region. The mission was to protect the health of the human population in the United States. They needed show that laws need to be written and enacted uh, by Congress to protect uh, mankind. Can they do something? There's two pictures right here. Uh, just in a, a few short years, what the EP did, EPA did. Uh, they, on the left, you can see smoke coming from burning discarded automobile batteries. Can't imagine that nowadays. Uh, the, the pollution that would be up there. Just in three years, these are the same smokestacks that the plant was closed to get better environmental protection. The EPA looked at the Safe Drinking Water Act. There are more than 150,000 public water companies out there. They decided that each of them needs to be tested, and they had to be tested by a third-party analytical lab. Maximum levels of each contaminant was developed. A uh, certain amount of copper could be out there, a certain amount of lead, a certain amount of pesticide. These all had to be controlled and treated before the water could be passed on to the cities. Uh, they also looked at... Um, the commercial aircraft, the EPA went out and tested water there. It showed 15% showed ingestion of bacteria. For example, E. coli that was in these airline water supplies and stuff. So consequently, new regulations were developed for testing. Action plans had to be developed. Uh, the public had to be notified. The attendants on the plane had to be ready to prove that this water was okay for drinking. We also looked at uh, lead in the water. We've been concerned for many years that lead was in our paint. And uh, this was getting into our children's environment. Lead was also in the water. So the EPA uh, started mandatory testing again of all the public water supplies. They led to elimination of lead and copper as being a contaminant in our public water supplies. Most recent testing was effective in 96% of systems. The Safe Water Drinking Act, again, looked at this. They looked at everything the EPA had done in 
added more regulations on top of this. Uh, all of these to protect uh, all Americans. They've said that the EPA must conduct another cost-benefit analysis of every new community system that was out there. They needed to protect us from microbial contaminants. They needed to have uh, training for all the people that work there to ensure that uh, all Americans were free from any contamination in the water. They also showed that we had a right to know uh, what was in our water, where it comes from, how it's treated, and how we help protect it. The murders and rapes that were heard for weeks uh, were very easy to look at when you saw the garbage floating in the water. Companies now have become responsible for this. Companies now had to go into the riverways and the lakes around their plants and make sure you didn't see problems that you see in this photograph on the right hand side. They received uh, quite good guidelines for this and, uh, and ways to uh, punish them, uh, usually a monetary fine, but when the EPA found debris floating in the waters out there. It wasn't just cities that did this, even large agricultural facilities um, that were not in the city uh, were forced to, to clean up their areas. The makers of the chemicals, the makers of the fertilizers, the pesticides, the herbicides, uh, also had to become more environmentally sensitive. When you walk past a, a pond and you're seeing green scum across there, you know that this was probably because of overuse of chemicals. We've now learned that we can actually cut down on some of the chemicals and we can change this amount and so we don't have this algae bloom in ponds and lakes. We've learned that we can take dishwasher liquid that used to be filled with phosphorus change it and it still works as effectively but now we don't get this runoff into lakes and streams and we don't get as much algae bloom. Other acts were out there and as you look at the readings and videos uh, you'll see more ideas. We have the uh, Resource Conservation and Recovery Act to talk about the disposal of solid waste. We do know that there is a comprehensive environmental response a Compensation and Liability Act. Uh, this is what we call a super fund, where we can clean up the sites that are contaminated by hazardous substances. Uh, the, the paint plants where we didn't realize uh, there were hazardous substances in it. Now we have funds to control them. There are other laws out there. Again, please review the videos and readings uh, to see them.